Meguiar's presents Car Crazy, the show that focuses on the people behind the cars. Most kids like to play with cars, but for some, it becomes an obsession. This type of person, and there are millions of us, have an unusual preoccupation with cars. And sometimes it is not at all rational. Indeed, we are talking about people of all ages and all walks of life who are certifiably car crazy. Hi, I'm Barry McGuire, and I've spent my entire life working and associated with people who are crazy about their cars. This show is intended to gain insight into these people and understand why they are so car crazy. It's been called a contagious disease, and we hope this show will help you catch the bug if you haven't already. Hi, everybody, and welcome to this special episode of McGuire's Car Crazy. You know, I get asked all the time what my favorite episode of McGuire's Car Crazy is, or who has been my best interview, or what was my favorite story. Well, you know, they're all my favorites, but there are some that stand out. So we selected some of our best stories from our past guests, and we collected them in this very special best of episode of McGuire's Car Crazy. Today's guests are four superstars of the hot rodding world. We have Wally Parks, what can you say about a man who is one of the early organizers of hot rodding? Then Big Daddy Don Garlitz, considered the granddaddy of drag racing. Next, his family visits start out on the dry lakes, and today, Vic Edelbrock Jr. carries on that tradition with his daughters. And a show about hot rodding wouldn't be complete without customizers and the antics of Blackie Gigian and Norm Grabowski. Don't go away. McGuire's Car Crazy will be right back. Welcome back to McGuire's Car Crazy and our best of hot rodding edition. In 1951, Wally Park saw a need for safety to get hot rodders off the streets, so began to lay the groundwork for the National Hot Rod Association with his wife, Barbara. Over 50 years later, it's become the largest motorsport sanctioning body in the world, and Wally Parks is considered the godfather of hot rodding. Deservedly so, he has received so many honors, including McGuire's Treasure of the Hobby Award, and his stories of how hot rodding first began are fascinating. The term hot rod, actually the first time I ever heard that was when I was out in the South Pacific and one of our new recruits into the company came in from, or the, the, uh, the group came in from San Luis Obispo and talked about the hot rods that they had fun with. I'd never heard that expression before, but my own personal experience started long before that. Actually, I ran my first car at uh, what is now Edwards Air Force Base in 1933. Turned 82 and 1900 miles an hour. So I was involved with uh, a lot of activities prior to going into the service. And then after that, we had a chance to reestablish the whole thing and it took off from there. The whole racing uh, that, uh, that has taken place on the salt flats, you really prompted that to happen, didn't you? Well, I helped. There, you know, I get credit for an awful lot of things that there were hundreds of us that really achieved and accomplished. But I was the one that led the little crusade up to Salt Lake City and got the first permission for us to run on the Salt Flats. And we ran our first event there in 1949. And at that time, of course, Hot Rod Magazine was new and fresh. And I was the first editor of it. And we were the co-sponsors right. of that event. The association we now know is the SETA, Southern California Timing Association. Um, another great organization that you helped birth. Well, I, I was lucky to be in the right place. I Boy, guess, I, timing right is everything. Yeah. <laughs> I don't <laughs> think it was just coincidental. I think it has something yeah. to do with the man. <laughs> well, I don't know. I was, I was very fortunate because the first job that I ever had at the Dry Lakes was the first one I went to, and I had to hitchhike to get there and didn't have anything to do. So after a while, I volunteered, and they gave me a military headset for a field phone and put me in the back of a dump truck midway of the course and said, you keep us alerted at the starting line if there are any problems. And so I sat out there all day with this uh, phone to my ear, but I had a chance to listen in on the party line uh, stuff that was going back and forth. And I think that's what really got me interested in the administrative side of, mm. of uh, motorsports and performance. You meet this young kid, 19-year-old kid named Bob Peterson. Mm. 
Uh, I'd like to hear that from, I've heard Bob talk about it so affectionately. He loves you well, and reveres you so much. Uh, I'd like to hear from your side of the, how that relationship all started. Oh, it, it, it started because at that time I had left my job with General Motors, which I'd gone back to after the end of World War II, and uh, was the general manager of the Southern California Timing Association. And uh, uh, I got a phone call from this kid that I didn't know uh, wanted to come and get together with me. and so. We set up a meeting and he came out to my house and introduced himself. He was 19, just about 20 years old at that time, unemployed, and was a part of a group called Hollywood Publicity Associates who were looking for clients. And I told him, but I did have an idea that I'd put together while I was still at General Motors on putting on a public car show and uh, that we could show the people the types of cars that were being worked on in, in the garages and, and maybe help overcome this image. And uh, he, he thought that was interesting, and so we arranged for a meeting with uh, Lee Ryan, who was a senior member of Hollywood Publicity Associates. Lee liked it, and as a result of that, why the SCTA and Hollywood Publicity Associates put together the world's first hot rod show. First hot rod show yeah. there at the, the Armory. Yeah, at the Armory, 19, January 1948. Folks, this is where the hot rod uh, hobby began. I mean, this is this is the very roots of it here. There are a lot well, of it parts. Was, it was Peter actually said, during the of, during the planning and preparation of uh, of that show that uh, Pete, who was out selling ads to the local speed shops, came up with the uh, the fact that there was no publication covering this type of activity. So he got Bob Lindsay, and they did it, and uh, named it Hot Rod Magazine. And the whole world told us that it was impossible. Wouldn't work. Yeah. It somehow did, though. You had this burning desire to how to make this whole hobby legitimate and safe. We've always known that uh, that safety was an issue that could either be favorable or unfavorable. It was a thing that uh, led us to uh, cooperative programs with uh, local civic leaders and law enforcement groups, which were very valuable to us as allies in those early formative times. And uh, so I, I think that you'll find uh, today where we have cars running on the drag strip in 1,320 feet going 320 miles an hour and faster and getting stopped in about the same amount of distance that there's been an awful lot of concentration on safety to make those things uh, possible and still get stopped before you run out of room. Stay tuned. We'll visit with the most infamous drag racer of all time right after this break. Welcome back to McGuire's Car Crazy. Another living legend is drag racing pioneer Big Daddy Don Garlitz. He survived not one, but two horrific accidents, and he got right back in the driver's seat to perfect top fuel racing. He talked to us about those experiences, and he showed us some of the most successful dragsters in his famous Swamp Rat series. You had this horrific accident. We have to, we have to talk about that for a few moments. That summer in June at Chester, I had a backfire in the traps, and I was engulfed in flames, no gloves, but I did have on a jacket. My wife had given me a jacket the week before because she thought that driving in a T-shirt was a little dangerous because you might have an accident and it would be scratch your elbows up. So a week before, you would have been in just a T-shirt? Just a T-shirt. Oh, my goodness. It, it, I would be dead. We wouldn't be having this conversation because I was burned so bad anyway. My hands were, they wanted to amputate both my hands because I was going to die of gangrene. So I came down to Tampa. The doctor there had done 5,000 sets of hands from Korea from tank burns, and he knew all about how to do it. And he saved both those hands, and uh, I lived to race again. Yeah. Then in 1970, you had an even more horrific accident. Yeah, the slingshot dragster, you know, that's where you sat in back and your feet were over the rear end and the drive shaft and the clutch was by your feet. We were pushing those things pretty much to the limit. We were running at 240 miles an hour with them. And I had a homemade two-speed transmission, they call it a garlic's drive, that the, we had made for the car. And sitting on the line there at Long Beach, I let that clutch out and that transmission exploded. And it was a mess chopped off part of my right foot, put me right in the hospital. It could have killed me. Pieces came, could have taken both my legs off at the knees. There was one piece went through the cowl that we gathered up, was a piece about that long, solid steel, sharp as a razor, and it went right through the cowl. Cut the car in two, broke my left foot five places and cut the front of my right foot off. Unbelievable. I said, if it's the last thing I'm ever gonna do, I'm gonna 
destroy the slingshot dragster. Well, it ended up being the first thing you did because even in the hospital, you're I'm making you're, plans. You're making plans already. Right. Yes. I was only hoping to have a car that was safe that would be competitive. But I didn't think I'd have one that was superior to everything out there. And talk about car crazy. In the midst, or immediately after this horrific accident with all the trauma that goes with it and everything, you're sitting in the hospital without hesitation designing your next race car. And my wife was having a fit, but the real fit came. In June, I went up to Bristol, Tennessee, and they were swingling. Tom Lemons had the car up there, and they were smoking the tires with it, and they weren't qualified. And there was one run left that late Saturday afternoon, and I said, let me drive that thing down there one time. So I jump in. You this, got back in the same car. I, I was still bandaged up on this oh, foot. My goodness. Off of my crutches. <laughs> set low, you are crazy, Doc. Low ET, top speed of me. Yeah, I was completely car crazy. The Garland's Museum of Drag Racing holds a treasure of memorabilia and over 175 of the most famous dragsters in drag racing history, including most of Big Daddy's Swamp Rat series. We had the rare treat of a private guided tour by Big Daddy himself. Over here is the exact car when the name was given to you as Swamp Rat. Talk about how did that name come about? The Swamp Rat was uh, hung on me by a guy in Detroit called Seto Pastore, and he was a top fuel racer, and he was starting a little controversy. So he put an ad in Drag News uh, right after I got Malone to drive. He said, it's no wonder they call you the Swamp Rat, so you're in this sport for what you can get. And you don't care about safety, you put a green kid in a fast top fuel dragster, and he goes right out and sets a record. Malone put Green Kid right, right on his helmet, and, <laughs> and I started calling car Swamp Rat from that day forward. And this looks like a mid 80s car. That's Swamp Rat 29. That's when I made my big comeback. Won a world championship with this as my second NHRA world championship, and set the record mm. at uh, 268 wow. miles an hour. Wow. But this is my favorite. <laughs> This is the Swamp Rat 1, the way it looked the first time out. This is a runner. You can see the little writing in there. That's when I take it out. Those are some of the times oh, yeah. it's turned. Oh. The current times, which is almost identical to that first time out at Brooksville. What a treasure. Uh, Don, I can't thank you enough for giving our viewers a taste. And that's all it's been is just a taste of this fabulous museum. I can't thank you enough. It's been a pleasure having you. I love showing off these cars. <laughs> and folks, if you're car crazy and you're ever in Central Florida, you have got to see this place. After this break, we're going to meet with Vic Out of Rock Jr. So don't go away. Welcome back to McGuire's Car Crazy. Two of the biggest names in all of hot riding are Vic Out of Rock Sr. and Vic Out of Rock Jr. That's right, the name Ed of Rock is not only a family business, but a family tradition. And the next generation of Ed of Rocks, his daughters, Cammy and Christy. We talked to Vic Ed of Rock Jr. about his father and his daughters. Let's go back when you're a kid. Lots of activity involving the car. Is there, is there a, a, a certain moment in time when you knew you just, this was gonna be your life? I knew it almost off the get-go, you know, when I used to go down with my father in, in uh, in his little garage and I was three or four years old and one day I was sitting on a bench and two guys went like this and I went I went fanny fanny first into a bucket of gunk and my <laughs> mother was not very happy about that and I used to go down and follow my father around and get in trouble and love to do things and started working there after school and or during the summer when I was 11 12 years old putting little screws and fittings or whatever I could do and, and it was just always there you know that goes back to the midget days when I could work on it and as my father kind of backed out of the program, and in the early 50s, when I turned 16, I wasn't supposed to be in the pits until you're 21, but I snuck in anyway. And I would go with Bobby Meeks, who took care of the car, and we'd kind of run it for a couple of years, and you know, my summers and such, and help take the car apart when it was done. And I got to take the engine apart, but I couldn't put it together, and things like that. Those were, those were real high moments. And of course now, vintage car racing is my passion, and, uh, and it's really something that's been in my heart for years that I've wanted to do. I finally, starting in 1987, 88, I finally got to go out and put that driver's suit on and, and, and that helmet and go out and, and, and run a car around a track, and that still is uh, top on my list. Now there's a gal with the Edelbrock name that gives you a run for the money once in a while. 
Oh, you're talking about Cammie, right. <laughs> Oldest daughter. We got her a Shelby, and, uh, and uh, now uh, she's right there, either in front of me or right behind me, so. That must be such we, fun. Oh, it is. We had a great time at Sears Point. We kind of went out, and I said, and I, she started behind me, and I said, now, Cammie, uh, if, you know, these guys in front of me are pretty fast, I'll race with them a little bit, and you stay right with me, and then, then let's come back, and you and I will play a little bit. So we did, you know, and then she had never played before. I said, told her to pass me, and she did, and then I passed her, and we went back and forth, and of course, the crowd love it, and she's, she's got a whole bunch of, of lady fans up there from this high on up, and, uh, and we really had a fun, you know, it was just, just fun racing with your daughter. Well, Vic, obviously you've experienced enormous success, but uh, how much sweeter is it that your daughters are in your business with you? Uh, it, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to put it in words, Barry, because it's just, it's just so great that they're here and that uh, they're involved, and, and we're doing the things that we're doing together. And uh, Cammie and Christy were both taught how to drive in, in a 65 Mustang. And, uh, and I forget, I never forget one night, Christy was, and she'll kill me for telling the story, but she was, she was going down, she was over in Manhattan Beach and, and somebody at a, at, a, at a stop sign, they put some oil on the, on the street. So they let her pull up into the stop sign and then they said, tell us how fast it'll go, you know, burn your tires and everything. So Christy bit and she, she got on it and she started going like this, like this and ended up right into some BMW in front of some guy's house and, <laughs> and, uh, and she learned a real lesson on that. But you know, that's, that's girls and I did it too in those experiences. That's what life is all about. It all starts back when my father gave me the opportunity and, and put all this together. This is the real uh, end result that we're that we're here today and they're here with us and we're, we're all having lots of fun. We call ourselves the fun team and, and, uh, and go, do it, go do it. Don't touch that remote. McGuire's Car Crazy ran into the comedy duo of Grabowski and Gigi at the LA Road to Show. You don't want to miss this. Welcome back to McGuire's Car Crazy. One very warm Father's Day, we made a trip out to the LA Road to Show where every year you can find hundreds of roadsters on display. We sat down with a handful of notorious hot rodders, but Norm Grabowski and Blackie Gigian have been around a while, and they took our normal car crazy interview to a different level. You were forever in the magazines. There's always something what Norm Grabowski is doing now. I noticed that I had an eye to look at stuff, and like, this needed to be moved back, this needed to be changed, and I kept changing the car. And this was Cookie's car. Exactly. And it got to be where it was, blue at flames on the rake, and that's when it just, it hit. And then I was so fortunate because Warner Brothers called them looking for a kooky car. For this new series, 77, 77. and Sunset Strip. Exactly. And so uh, I kooky went to Warner Brothers. the valet. Some of the young guys watching this may not yeah. remember that series. Well, but yeah, they can't help that. <laughs> we know. Yeah, we know. <laughs> but uh, so I went to Warner Brothers, and uh, they'd show them the car, and they, I could see they liked it. So I would take the car to the studio every time they called, and they say, we need the car. And of course, I would always be with the car in case it was a problem. Well, it became one of the most visible hot rods for obvious reasons. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. you had that car. Wherever you took that car, it was like oh, instant recognition. Well, okay, this is interesting because this happened one night. We walked out, out, uh, walked out to the car. There was a buddy with me. And there's people, even into the street, all around the car looking at the car, like 10 deep. And I said, excuse me, excuse me. One guy yells, I says, hey, wait your turn. <laughs> We could, yeah, but it's my car. You know? <laughs> so we, you know, the, the, these are the type of things that happen. Life magazine started chasing you around. Well, I was in Hollywood on, on another occasion, and just cruising, doing the normal thing, and I didn't know they were trying to get me to stop. So I finally pulled into a drive-in, and of course I drew the car, drew a crowd right away. They pulled in, introduced themselves. We're from Life Magazine. Would it be all right if we took some pictures? I said, sure. You know, I got a whole page in Life Magazine. Yeah. First, talk about how the public looked on hot riders back in those days. They were a little like uh, outlaw motorcycle riders. And for Life Magazine to put yeah. a, a focus on, on hot riding, if you will, was, and talk it, about knowing your It did me a lot of good. <laughs> well, it did the hobby a lot of good. I, 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 I I can't complain about my life. It's been a lot of fun, and it's all due to hot rods. I thoroughly enjoy the people that are in the, the, the camaraderie with street riders is just great. Yeah. That's all I can tell you. Yeah. It's just great. It's great fun. 
Well, Norm, on behalf of Hot Riders Everywhere, man, uh, thank you for being one of the icons, one of the guys that made all this possible for us. Thank you, I appreciate it. Barry, does that go okay? <laughs> Norm, you're always the awesome <laughs> interview. <laughs> hey, I think it was fun, it was fun. That's great. Hey, I gotta go find Blackie. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Take care, buddy. Uh, Norman, what, what are you doing what? here? Hey, Barry, what I'm looking for you. <laughs> hey, have a hey we don't need him anyway. Take Barry's chair, man. Are you gonna interview me or what? Well, we'll work it out, we'll ad lib. You know, what the heck? Blackie, did you ever dream from the old days where this thing was gonna go? Never, never. I mean, it's it's unbelievable. Yeah, and, it's, and it's, it isn't gonna stop here. As time goes on, we're gonna get older, and this sport here is gonna get... We're gonna get older? I don't, I don't wanna get older. <laughs> <laughs> would you ever imagine that I we know. would have things like this? I mean, I won the world's most beautiful rooster back in 1955. I was very envious, you know. My shop burned down. <laughs> that, I was, lost, that was a shame. I lost yeah, everything. I know you did, I know. Hid the car over, 44 years later, restored the car, took it back to Oakland for the 50th. But the greatest thing that ever happened, Norman, I was invited to Pebble Beach. When I went to Pebble Beach. I heard, I heard. And I, that was another, you feel? That, you feel? that was another level. Wasn't that, I know. That was another, in fact, look, look at the goose pimples I'm getting because of the thought of it. Pebble Beach, I hear they wear these classy shirts, expensive shoes with no socks. Is that true? <laughs> Maybe, you know, maybe the, we ought to join them. <laughs> maybe we, we'll be in their category. The guys with the Duesenbergs and <laughs> yes, you know, the Packers. That's why and, I yeah. say we'll be in their category. The, the Delahays. But I'll tell the, you yeah, what, I, I wouldn't trade all my life for where I have went through with our type of living and building the type of cars and enjoyment. Black, it's always good to see you. But I wonder what happened to Barry. You know, I, he was supposed to interview you. I know it. I mean, I I'm mean, just sitting the, here and waiting and cooking, waiting for him. I don't know where oh, he's at. Oh, Lucky. Hey. Oh, hey, Barry. Hey, okay. Where have you been? Yeah. Yeah. Great interview. Well, I've already did the interview with Norman here. Yeah. You I, already did the interview. Well, we finished without you. Where I kind of took over, OK? Well, fine I hope thing. you don't mind. Well, fine thing. <laughs> It's our privilege to share with you the wisdom and the insights of some of the most fascinating people in the car hobby. Today's guests are not only my friends, they're my heroes. A big thank you to them for opening up their hearts to us and to you, our viewers, for being car crazy. Car Crazy has been brought to you by the Meguiar's family of appearance car care products. Meguiar's, the trusted experts in surface care since 1901.